cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. We wanted people that were insanely great at what they did. Nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the internet was going to be a fad. All right. Today on the podcast, we're doing something different. We um, want to go deep on a business, a business that we think is in a super crowded space but has emerged as just a rock star company because they do something very different. Um, and that company is, is Trader Joe's, um, which, Jonathan, do you go to Trader Joe's? Do you, is that in, in the rotation where, where you are right now? I don't think it's an option, but do you attend Trader Joe's? Absolutely. Yeah. Trader Joe's was actually my favorite um, when I was, especially in Seattle, was my favorite go-to. It was also my neighborhood. And I remember picking my the apartment I was going to you know stay in specifically because it was on the same street as a Trader Joe's. So yeah, I'm glad to talk about them. Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of the five seed almond bars and the peanut filled uh, pretzels. Um, I, I thought I was special for getting those. Turns out those are like two of their most popular items. So I'm not that special. I'm just like every other dude. But um, so why are we talking about a grocery store? Basically, what Jonathan and I want to do is like, we have a growth agency growth hit, and it is exhausting to grow a business that doesn't have something special. So much so that like, we've started working with clients who are before we will even work with you. It's like, what's your true point of differentiation? Do you have an irresistible offer that's unique and different? Because if not, like we don't even want to work together. But if we find a client that does, they have a, a great offer, a great product. They're owning a niche. We're like, game on, let's go. And so we thought it'd be fun to break down some of these companies and, and why they're special and they're just a breakout kind of different success. But anything you want to add to that, Jonathan? Yeah, you're totally right. The worst thing in the world is to work on a business that uh, is not differentiated. It's just a me too business. And uh it's, it's really like pushing a boulder up a mountain. It's, it's just not worth the effort. Uh, Trader Joe's is like, it's, it's, it's built a way to get their fans and not customers, that's intentional, hooked. They've created evangelists in a space where you wouldn't expect something like this to exist. It's like people are talking about, you know, how tech companies nowadays have engineered um, like slot-like experiences on your phone to get people hooked. And these people have done it in the real world in the least tech savvy or tech you know, influenced way. So it's a fascinating company. And I think there's a lot to learn for everyone. Yeah, I'm reading the book about the Patagonia CEO, like let my people go surfing, or I think that's the title. And he talked yeah. about like, his hell would be the CMO of a cola company and having to compete in the cola wars where there's no product differentiation. And it's all about like distribution, ad buys and things like that, which was kind of funny. Um, all right, so let's let's get into Trader Joe's. First, what is it? It is a grocery store, a boring industry. Um, I try to figure out stats. I use good old chat GPT, and I don't know if it's true, but we'll go with it. It said in 2020, they did 13.3 billion. And what's interesting is out of every grocery store chain, they by far have the most sales per square foot, at like 4X the industry average. And what's interesting is, they do this where most grocery stores have like 35,000 SKUs. They have 3,000 SKUs. Um, so that's some of like, and we'll, we'll get into that because that gets into the point of differentiation. Uh, but we can get into the history. Did you see anything else with like numbers or stats? I couldn't get too much because it's privately held, obviously. Yeah, I think what was fascinating to me is that they were acquired by that German family um, or that, you know, very wealthy family that also owns Aldi very early on. I thought it was actually acquired later on after they'd achieved great success, but it's uh, yeah, it was fascinating that it was an early acquisition and something they've grown in quiet uh, without you know any data really slipping out into the public, with the exception of you know total revenue and store count. Yeah, and that they've grown it, like they acquired it and kept the integrity of it, and it really took off. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll give a little history of it. So 
uh, founded by Joe Colomb in 1950 in Pasadena, California. He was a Stanford uh, graduate. He went to like Stanford Business School. And here's what's interesting that I really want to call out because we want to look at these founders that come up with innovative ideas. And I want to call out that his first idea was not Trader Joe's and he just copied something else, which by the way, I think copying is great. He basically... Um, saw that 7-Eleven in Texas had the most sales per square foot. He's like, oh, there's no 7-Eleven in California. And he essentially made a clone. And then he had 16 of these stores. And basically his like big supplier, the milk supplier, his big investor guy was all pulling out. And he was about to just get his lunch handed to him. And so he had to do something different. And he launched Trader Joe's on the back of two key insights, which was so um, fascinating. One is the 7-Eleven stat, as far as sales per square foot, you don't have to have a huge grocery store with lots of SKUs, but less SKUs. But then the other thing, and this is something that you and I talk about, if you want to be different, find a wave to ride early. And it was a stat that it was like the rise of the educated. He was seeing how many more people were going to college. And he's like, wait a minute, there's going to be a rise where they don't want the same thing that everyone gets at Albertsons. They've traveled the world. They want things that are healthy. They, they want things that are a, a little bit fancier. Um, and so he went after that segment, which he calls the overeducated and underpaid. And as you look at the footprint of their locations, that's one of their business signals that we'll get into. But th that's kind of like, the and like you said, he sold to the German company, I think in like 88, in the late 80s. Um, well, what's in well, the late 70s, months. actually. I think it was late 79 70. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I have one other insight on him. This one um, is hilarious. He was left-handed and he had a bias to left-handed people because if you're left-handed, <laughs> you're used to seeing the world differently and having to work creative because everything is set up for you. You drive on the right side of the road, desk are set up for right-handed people, your knife and fork are for right-handed people. And so in interviews, he would make people write things so he could see if they were left-handed or right-handed. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I think one thing that's also quite interesting about them is even though they've grown a lot, obviously since the 1979, I think over 505 locations uh, upon doing some research for them, um, they still retain that local feel. Um, I thought it was quite interesting that they hire artists to come in and like and sketch out the, the name of the products and the, uh, the price. Um, all stores are also furnished obviously within a certain brand guideline, but very custom to that place, the location. And it feels like your corner store, even though it's part of a mega franchise with 500 five stores and, you know, tens of billions in revenue. So it's a very unique balance that they've managed to strike there. Yeah. So, so the whole point is like, okay, what's our unique take on why Trader Joe's is special? What can people learn from it to apply it to their own business? So we'll break it down from like product distribution, their people, prices. Um, maybe it's worth starting with how they compare to the traditional um, grocery store, right? The traditional grocery store, 35,000 products, they have 3,000 products. Uh, the traditional grocery store is like 40,000 square feet. They're 10,000 square feet. And there was this um, study, they called it the, the jam test. It was uh, someone I think at Cal Berkeley did this study on choice. And they saw that uh, at grocery stores, people would leave out 24, they did this test where there's a lot of options for products where people would come and check it out. But the people that I actually bought was super low because they were paralyzed by it. So she did this study where at a grocery store, she had 24 jams and then she had six jams. And what she saw was the conversion rate for the samples with six was like 4X better than that with 24 because people were overwhelmed. So actually having less choice is better. And that's something that kind of like embodies Trader Joe's because they're not going to have like, I don't know, the 20 different types of smoothies or protein shakes or whatever. It's like there's the one, two or three options, right? It's like, oh, we don't have that fancy like peach spicy salsa this week. We have the watermelon salsa and that's what you get. And I think that is like a bold move to have your whole business model around that idea of less choice rather than more because every grocery store wants to just like 
have everything you need. So you're a one-stop shop. So like, as far as like their setup, I thought that was like one big kind of point of differentiation that's worth calling out. Yeah, I think another huge one, of course, is that they have their own product lines. Um, and a funny story, actually, I heard about this on a radio program, like it has to be a decade ago or something. There was this guy who used to come to past the border, the US-Canada border into Washington state, buy a ton of Trader Joe's inventory from multiple stores so he doesn't get caught, smuggle it back into the Canadian border. It had his own mini Trader Joe's outpost that was not Trader Joe's owned. And he was selling Trader Joe's uh, product to the Canadians at, at a markup. So there are product lines, their products, their unique Trader Joe's branded products are unique. And what I broke, what broke my heart when I was doing the research is, most of it isn't actually Trader Joe's branded. It's like take, for example, Annie's mac and cheese. Trader Joe's goes to Annie's and they liked the Annie's mac and cheese. So they rebrand, they put it in a different Trader Joe's packaging, but most people fall for it. And that's a significant portion of the product skew is like that. So uh, it's definitely, it's huge. And even the packaging, you can take a DiGiorno's pizza that everyone might not like and might find to be unhealthy. But when it's packaged in, um, in, you know, that's organic, you know, health conscious uh, Trader Joe's packaging, it looks like something healthier. So they've managed to repackage the same products in a way that looks healthier and uh, and even obviously cheaper, uh, less expensive for people. So fascinating uh, insights on that one. What was that person? I, I listened, I think it was on like Freakonomics or NPR that wasn't the guy called like Pirate Joe or something who was like. I think that's it. Yeah, that, that sounds right. <laughs> that, that actually sounds really right. Yeah, I don't remember the exact name, but that wouldn't surprise me if that's it. Yeah, I, I saw yeah. that same thing on that they white label everything because their pita chips that I'm a big fan of are actually just the Stacy's pita chips or whatever. But here's what's interesting so Bed Bath and Beyond, which just filed for bankruptcy. They had a Target exec that came in and they started to um, make their own products and white label others, but it didn't work for them. I don't know if because electronics, it doesn't work as well. But one big call out is because I don't think they understood people positioning, branding, copywriting. Because when I was looking at this book around the Trader Joe's founder, um, he was a huge fan of Ogilvy. And he was like always quoting uh, Ogilvy, um, David Ogilvy, who's obviously like the iconic um, advertiser. And one thing that he read was, the more you tell, the more you sell. And so they have this thing, the fearless flyer that we can talk about where they don't do any ads. All they do is do this flyer that just really editorializes their products. And the other interesting thing is they don't have like a traditional CMO their role for like a director of marketing is a director of words, phrases, and pauses. So if you ever look at their packaging, they like over index for amazing copywriting. Cause that, cause if it's going to be these like white label products and it's an educated audience, they know to speak to them, you need to speak that language. So it's something that like, as I'm reading the packages, I'm totally following for it, but I'm like, these are, yes, these are basically Cheeto balls, but like these like artisanal, like whatever cheese uh, puffs are, you know, Cheetos, but that's fine. Yeah, it's, it's very obvious that they're, they're led by marketers. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even like they, I believe if I'm not mistaken, have a podcast and that's probably the only grocery chain in the world that has podcasts and they understand <laughs> really? the value of, con yeah, it does. It's the only, and they understand the value of continuing to talk with, with their customers. So uh, it's fascinating. And I remember receiving the, uh, the, the, the newsletter and it was the only thing that I wouldn't throw out that I would actually give an additional media to quickly, you know, uh, read and glance at. Um, so everything from, you know, the packaging, the copywriting on it was always fascinating. Um, and actually to continue on this, um, they've really thought through the entire experience uh, with extreme extreme thoughtfulness, like everything from the moment you drive into that crowded small parking lot, all the way to the moment you interact with the first um, clerk, or actually in their case, they call them um, crew members. So instead of, you know, employees in their Hawaiian shirts to the moment you, you know, read those fascinating uh, product names that have been really well thought out. And then the artist sketched names and, and prices the moment you go to the uh to the aisles where they're you know bells ringing 
Um, and you have to interact with a person. And even the way they hire their people and they pay them above market rate is they're looking for gregarious people who are you know, very sociable, who will engage with people, talk through their own experiences consuming the products to get people to engage with it. And as a, as a consumer, you can also sample anything in the store. Uh, so it's not like one of those stores where you like sneak in a few grapes and eat it as you're buying it. And this one, you're actually allowed to ask for anything and, and eat it on the spot, to sample it at least. And they've just thought through that entire experience. And it kind of reminds me of how Apple has done the same thing with like engineering the way that they want you to, like the, the box opening experience to make it feel premium with like the right amount of friction on the box. They're very much like that. And they, they started doing this a long time ago. So everything from parking lot to the moment the person rings the bell and you have to interact with your cashier, that's all been very methodically thought out. And I think that's what their key like uh, secret sauce is. Uh, it's not even the product because as we just discussed, it's actually um, Annie's macaroni and cheese in a different box. So fascinating company. So that is the hack Jonathan and I give for you. They actually are told that if someone asks if they can try something, the co the worker there is allowed to stop what they're doing and open up the bag of whatever and get you a free snack. So basically lunchtime, you can get a free lunch. Yeah. Trader Joe's. And the other like I go there with my kids and like they have like surprises of like, oh, see where you can find like our hidden dog today. They're like handing out stickers. And like your point is super interesting. Most grocery stores stock at night, they stock during the day to create conversation with you and the employees, even though their aisles are more narrow than others. And so it's like, you might think it's like quaint and cute how they have it set up, but it is like all strategically designed in, in how they have that set up. And one thing in that book about the founder, the other thing, he wasn't just obsessed with David Ogilvy, he was actually obsessed with cults on like, do you build a cult? And because he wanted it to have those traits and he would make funny jokes um, around like um, create a cult, but make, make sure you never cross their principles or they will cross you back. And so like how some things are, are very sacred um, for them. Um, so I thought that one was super interesting. The other thing that um, I also like, it's so easy for us to like look back and praise like how genius they are, but um there's like a couple things that happened in the early days that led to this path. One was when you're a smaller grocery store, there's a their their egg guy came to them is like, hey, none of the big stores are gonna buy our, our jumbo extra large eggs because they just can't support it with how they stock things. It's not scalable. We'll give you these same eggs, but at the or these bigger eggs, but at the same price. And Trader Joe's is like, oh, perfect, because we only have one thing for eggs. It doesn't matter which ones they are. And so they use that to their advantage where they would get these like products that were kind of outliers, but they would editorialize them like normal legs, but 12% bigger, the same, but for the same price where they're then beating the big stores that turn these eggs down. Cause they were kind of like weird. And now you see that as like a, a major thing, but that's all because of them. Um, and then there was the other one um, with they really started to own the high quality, low price wine market because the overeducated, underpaid person wanted good wine. And then being in California, I don't know if you remember like two buck Chuck, it's the $2 wine yeah. that they had yeah. um, that really kind of put them on the, on the map. And so it's like, you know, knowing the like best value deals you can get they editorialize it but they also have the lowest prices which you don't see that too often because not saying that trader joe's is premium or luxury but it doesn't feel like cheap but it is the best prices yeah it's the best of all worlds and actually uh the point you came up with earlier like that like truck to shelf model that they have it's fascinating because my first ever job um a long long time ago was at target and uh, it was my first experience working and uh, I was very young. And we used to work in the, in the back room. We were in the stock room and half of a typical target is really the back room where everything is stored. And Trader Joe's has the advantage of literally unloading and taking it directly to the shelves, which feels medieval based on all the, you know, the modern, um, uh, what's called modern retail giants, but it's fascinating. It, it reduces a lot of costs for them. And it forces, as you said, the, um, in their case, the crew member, 
not an employee, to stop during the day in those crowded aisles. So it forces you to interact with their employees and learn more about their products. So it's actually well thought out. It has a lot of advantages for them. And I think what fascinates me with them as well is like they're in this day and age, they're not very, it's, it's not a uh, tech first company. I remember during COVID, uh, I'd open up my phone, go to Instacart, hoping to find a Trader Joe's on there. And you can't find Instacart on there. They don't, they don't want you to, to buy your groceries and not interact with their employees or go into the store and experience it because that is the, that is part of the Trader Joe's experience. They don't want self-checkout. So while everyone is rushing to remove people from the equation, Trader Joe's still wants people to be part of that experience for you because that's what differentiates them. Uh, that's, uh, that's part of it. And obviously they, they pay their employees better than everyone else as well. They don't have loyalty programs like other big retailers. They don't want your data. Uh, I remember hearing a story that Target knew that one of their customers was pregnant before their spouse because they they saw their unique shopping behavior and would send them coupons. <laughs> um, Trader Joe's is never going to do that. So you feel safe as well in that interesting way. Um, and they've, I think, cultivated this interesting experience where it's like an amusement park for adults because you're going in, you don't know what you're going to find. It could be new interesting things or your old product may have been retired. So it kind of encourages you to go there and actually even accidentally buy more things than you'd want. I don't think Trader Joe's is the place you'd go if you had like a, a short list of shopping items you wanted to get, three or four. You'd go in and you'd find something that's interesting where it has a cool name or maybe this other thing that looks healthy, even though it's not. And you'd buy way more than you initially expected. So uh, that's something that's happened to me in the past as well. You almost over always overspend in a Trader Joe's because there's so many interesting things that you'd find along your way. Oh yeah, you got to get the dried mango slices. Those are impossible for me to say no to. So I like, the other thing that I'm interested in is like this idea of like business jujitsu where you take the strength of the incumbent, but then make it their weakness. Cause it's like, oh, big grocery store like Walmart can't compete with Trader Joe's because like the whole benefit of Trader Joe's is that it's not Walmart, that it's not huge. It's, um, you know, doesn't have all of the options. It's more curated and they have like low prices as well. So it's kind of like that part is really interesting because like with any business for a point of differentiation, it's like, what's the moat here? And there's a lot from the brand to the business model to the unit economics. Um, and the other thing that was funny is the way they pick their locations is where the overeducated, underpaid work around like, okay, people that are journalists, people that work for the symphony um, and, and different things like that. And the other thing that I thought was interesting, they, like you said, they don't do advertising, they'll do direct mail, but they actually won't do it to people. They'll do it to this house where, where like, the person that fit in their demo lives. But when that person moves, they're like, you know what? I bet someone that's a similar persona type is going to move in and it's within the same mile radius. Um, because for like a company like us that does a lot of like online ads, Facebook ads, digital marketing, I'm always kind of like, like direct mail is this kind of like untapped, interesting unicorn of a world to me. So it was, it was cool to see their their approach to it. Yeah, and it's also just the... Um... You know, they have a, a, a tasting team that goes around that's responsible for picking items that they're going to sell to their to their customers. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if, if people don't respond well to it, they'll quickly retire it. Uh, but that I think that's a huge departure from everyone else because there's a slotting system where, you know, precious real estate on shelves is reserved for the, bis the biggest and best brands. So if you're a, a, a new cola manufacturer, you can never, almost never, um, outcompete Coca-Cola and Pepsi for their precious real estate on retail store, which you call it, retail space. But at um, Trader Joe's, they even have their own cola brand, but they use their internal team to find these products that are highly likely to resonate with their audience because they already know that audience, as Jim, as you said, but it's, it's based on merit rather than size of those brands, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. it, it just gives that that aura of you're going to find something cool that's healthy, that's been, you know, properly vetted by the right people. And that's a huge difference from everyone else in the retail space. I think almost everyone uses the, the slotting system. Right. Yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. So as we like wrap this up, what are your big takeaways? By the way, this is the longest I've ever talked about a grocery store. Um, what is <laughs> like the main takeaways? Because if you're going to launch a business or grow a business, 
What yeah. are you taking from the Trader Joe's growth Bible? There's actually one big thing that I'll take away from this. That's not something I've said so far. It's most companies, especially in, in capitalism, is it's all about maximizing the bottom line, more revenue, more profit. But if you build a relationship with your customers, that's very similar to a Costco where you're not trying to maximize the amount of money you squeeze out of them, but you're like their buying partner, you're going to curate the best experience for them. People trust you and people will, will come to you because they know they're going to get the best prices, the lowest prices possible on, th on high quality goods as well. And I think Costco and Trader Joe's are probably the two, maybe Ikea as a third. Uh, retailers, I think, that have built that kind of relationship. And if you've noticed, these retailers are very difficult to dis disrupt. They built loyalty. In the case of Costco, they have their membership. Um, IKEA, I mean, almost every retailer has ever has, has tried to disrupt them, and it's almost impossible. Uh, and then Trader Joe's, obviously, even in a, in a world where everyone is shopping online, people will drive and intentionally inconvenience themselves to go into a small parking lot and struggle to find parking and go through all the you know the challenges because they enjoy that experience. So it has to be about a relationship you build with your customers and they need to feel like you're their partner and you're thinking and acting in their best interest. You're giving them things that they otherwise wouldn't get um, from you know, the sea of competition that exists. And I think if you can do that, you literally won the game because you're a one of one and you can't be copied. Um, even bigger companies can't copy you. You've built so many like points of differentiation that it's... Um, it's like you're in a, the most secure position imaginable. Yeah, especially in a grocery store, like industry, so commoditized to build like a brand and affinity for that. Super interesting. I think my biggest point yeah. of differentiation is like literally just how they like zagged when everybody zigged or whatever you want to say. It's just like these small things like really compound to grade this really impressive business model and mode from the square footage to the number of SKUs to how they position their products. Um, it's, it's, it's super interesting because it's easy to just copy people, but it's like, instead of copy, like do the complete opposite, especially if it can be your unfair advantage. Um, that, and I want to study cults more uh, for building an audience. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we, we should actually do a breakdown of like the brands that have the biggest cult like following um, that that could be an interesting one, like why they have that following. Yeah, Apple, I think definitely comes to number one. And I think I'm a cult follower there. That's why I say that. But uh, yeah. it's it's like once you get in, once you're an Apple user, you look down on other people that have Android phones. <laughs> like when I see someone with an expensive Samsung, yeah. I'm like, what were you thinking to get that phone? Yes. A very arrogant and, and uh, yeah. yes, not because it's not that. a brand, but you definitely see like the CrossFit Colton some brands out of that. I'd even say Rivian right now is starting to create a cult around it, um, which is interesting. I see like the Rivian like camping communities that are emerging, and it's it's interesting. Wow, that's I didn't know that at all. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I see that a bunch here in Seattle. Um, well, cool, man. well, I'm interested to see if people like this, this format, um, cause it'd be fun to go down the path of other businesses or even other similar businesses, like a, a, a episode just on like cult like brands or challenger companies that went after incumbents or, or whatnot. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens here. I, and this was actually really fun. I'd say one of the most fun podcasts we've had so far as well. So yeah, it goes. forced us to read who who won the research battle. I thought I won until you told me that uh, Trader Joe's had a podcast. When I realized I actually didn't even go to their website to do any research, so uh, I use Chat GPT articles and podcasts. Oh, actually, I didn't use Chat GPT on this one, so maybe you won based on that. But uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge Trader Joe's user as well, so and a fan. So you know, maybe I'm um, I'm speaking more about myself here. It's coming from the heart. All right, man. Yes, well, good up there. Cool. Thanks, Jim.